Well, hello and welcome everybody to an OpenShift Commons briefing. Um, we're repeating what we do every Kubernetes release um, is try and coerce Clayton Coleman, who's our lead architect for OpenShift and lots of other things um, Kubernetes related at Red Hat. Um, and we've just gotten Kubernetes 1.7 out the door, I think sometime late last night, the SIG release team posted it. So it is up and out and ready for consumption. So very timely that we get this um, update from Clayton. And so the format we're going to do is we're going to let Clayton do his presentation. You can ask questions in the chat. There's lots of people on the call. Um, so we may get some of them answered during the chat, but the good questions or, and then we'll open it up for Q&A at the end and we'll read those out and get those in. This recording should be up um, by the end of day today on blog.openshift.com and um, we'll be making it available um, as quickly as we can because we know you're all interested in this. So without any further ado, Clayton, uh, why don't you introduce yourself and take it away. Great, thank you. Great, thank you. So my so name is Clayton Coleman, as Diane mentioned, I'm the uh, Kubernetes uh, and OpenShift architect at Red Hat. I uh, have been working on Kubernetes since the very beginning, and uh, this is a very exciting release for us. Um, there's a ton of uh, both great new features, um, as well as changes coming to Kubernetes that make it um, even more of a platform. So I broke um, the, the features I'll talk about today uh, are just a, a taste of what's coming in Kubernetes 1.7. Uh, there's a, a huge number of uh, bug fixes, performance improvements, um, practical real world problems that people have hit on all of the different uh, platforms that Kubernetes runs on. Uh, I wanted to talk about kind of four top level themes. Um, these, are, these are part of the ongoing uh, evolution of Kubernetes. Uh, making sure that uh, as a as a platform and as a place to run uh, containerized applications that Kubernetes uh, keeps getting better and better, that the Kubernetes community becomes stronger and that other people in uh, the world can not just run Kubernetes, but can also extend and enhance Kubernetes to solve uh, their own problems and to solve uh, challenges that they face that uh, not everybody else uh, may have. So the, the, the four arcs are um, runtime, which typically deals with the core um, of the system, security, uh, extensibility, and running applications. And as we go through, um, I'm going to start by talking about extensibility, because I think when we when it comes down to it, that's the key change in Kubernetes 1.7. If you walk away today uh, with one one thought is that our goal um, both at Red Hat and the broader Kubernetes community is to make Kubernetes a platform that is extensible, um, that can be extended uh, in all sorts of ways to add new capabilities, uh, to be easier to develop against and to be more modular, to allow people to disable and uh, disassemble Kubernetes and reassemble it in the ways they'd like, uh, to enable powerful integrations like OpenShift to run on top of Kubernetes, as well as to make it easy for uh, administrators and integrators to plug their own policy into Kubernetes. And so there's five features um, that I, there's four features that I wanted to call out here in Kubernetes 1.7. Um, they're all in alpha or beta that deal with how we extend Kubernetes as a platform. So the first, um, many people who've worked with Kubernetes may have heard about third-party resources. Um, this is a, uh, an alpha feature um, that has existed for uh, since at least Kubernetes 1.2. And in this release, um, we took the feedback from a, a large number of people in the community, uh, worked with people who had built extensions using third-party resources, and tried to get um, all of the requirements captured, um, all of our lessons learned with third-party resources, get it boiled down into um, something that we believe we can support going forward. And so in Kubernetes 1.7, the third-party resource um, is being uh, transitioned to beta under the new name custom resource definition. So if you can see on the right, um, the name has changed. Um, a few of the fields have changed. Uh, there's a ton of underlying work in Kubernetes that makes uh, third-party resources more stable, um, that deals with challenges like upgrading third-party resources over time. And all of these improvements um, are specifically designed so that uh, when people build extensions to Kubernetes, uh, and 
when people run extensions on top of Kubernetes, that they can support those over the long term. For those who aren't familiar with the, uh, third party resources, in a sense, they're just like adding a new API to Kubernetes with the minimum possible amount of work. So you can um, give a name of a resource and uh, as an administrator install that. When that becomes enabled, uh, an end user who has permission to create those can um, go and request those. There's not a lot of control or structure in those. They're, they're designed to be ad hoc. They're designed to be easy to set up and install. And there's a number of community projects that have uh, latched onto third-party resources to store the, the API definitions that uh, make up their extension. And so uh, we do, uh, we have left room in third-party resources for future enhancement. Uh, we do think that over time, uh, third-party resources um, under their new ages of custom resource definition will um, become more powerful. We'd like to add more features. But um, this is typically the place where extensibility to Kubernetes starts. Uh, it's the easiest way to get started, but it doesn't necessarily capture all the use cases. And so uh, a second uh, feature that we've added in Kubernetes uh, 1.7 um, is a part of work that was in um, a very alpha form in Kubernetes 1.6, but it is the ability to register and define new APIs um, that actually have a, um, a backend that is implemented in code. And so the difference between API extension um, and registration and uh, the custom resource is the custom resource is entirely provided by the end users of custom resources. There's no validation. Um, there's no external logic preventing uh, changes to these APIs. But on the flip side, as you begin to develop an API, you may find that you want to impose more policy. You may want to define validation rules in uh, source code. And so API registration allows you to implement those APIs and then plug them into a Kubernetes server. So the, the API is registered um, with the Kubernetes API server, and the Kubernetes API server will act as a proxy to that new uh, that newly defined API. And in a sense, if a custom resource is about uh, an end user perhaps not having to bring code, but able to quickly iterate on their new policy object, the uh, API uh, registration path is more when someone has written in code a fairly powerful uh, API service. And we think of um, custom resources as the place that you start. And in many cases, as Kubernetes grows, as more people build APIs that extend Kubernetes or offer new features alongside Kubernetes, that the second mechanism of registration will be how the vast majority of them um, end up implementing. In the diagram, you can, um, you know, as, an, as a concrete example, if I registered a new API um, called my API, I would define uh, where that server is. And, and the expectation is that that's something that could run on Kubernetes as a service, um, but it could also run off Kubernetes if necessary. When a client talks to Kubernetes to find out uh, what the list of uh, APIs that Kubernetes supports, Kubernetes will return not just, um, for instance, the apps v1 beta 1 group, which is a part of the core um, Kubernetes project today, but it also returns that custom API group. Uh, a client would then talk to the Kube API server um, and it would receive the request proxied through the server. Uh, when we think about how this will evolve, um, much of the work that we've done in OpenShift to enable Kubernetes to be a true platform, we've looked at it through um, how OpenShift resources might plug in to Kubernetes. And so OpenShift offers a number of APIs above and beyond Kubernetes. Some of those are um, parallels to, uh, to features that are um, starting to reach GA in Kubernetes, like deployments and ingress uh, for routes and deployment configs. But other of those, like builds, image streams, templates, and uh, a number of the OpenShift policy objects have no equivalent in Kubernetes. And so we think about um, this custom API extension as a way for someone like OpenShift um, who has built an API that works very well natively with Cube and being able to simply and easily run that both on top of Cube and plug into Cube. So over the next few releases of uh, Kubernetes and OpenShift, we expect to see this used um, by more production grade um, extensions and custom resources um, will still be available uh, for end users to use uh, when they're prototyping. 
And there'll always be a trade-off in terms of uh, whether you want something that's simpler and easier to install or whether you're looking to build more complex policy um, and things that aren't quite possible without writing code. Uh, each of those will complement each other to kind of give the both sides of how do you add new capabilities to a Kubernetes server. Uh, along those lines, um, it's not just in Kubernetes, APIs are kind of the heart of the system. Um, you know, each of the Kubernetes APIs is about um, a simple declarative uh, representation of some concept like a service or a pod. Um, Kubernetes also has declarative resources for things like policy. So the RBAC engine in Kubernetes is a set of declarative resources. Uh, quota is a set of declarative resources. One of our goals uh, is if Kubernetes has simple APIs that are fairly declarative, um, often there are rules and policies that need to be imposed on top of that. Um, a large, large chunk of how Kubernetes or how OpenShift extends Kubernetes today is to add uh, is to add a, a large set of policy that makes Kubernetes a fully multi-tenant system. And so when we talk about um, what it would take to turn Kubernetes into a true platform, a real key goal and a and a common request is to allow policy decisions that are made when an end user submits an application to Kubernetes to be delegated to uh, an integration or an extension that a team may run uh, for specific use cases. In Kubernetes 1.7, there's a new alpha feature that uh, is being that's broadly characterized as extensible admission control. Um, every time you submit a resource to a Kubernetes server, if you create a pod or a service, um, define an ingress or a deployment, there is a uh, an internal bit of code that runs, which is called the admission chain. And that applies policy like um, quota and uh, pod security policy, as well as a, a number of other things that have developed over time, like calling out to see whether images are allowed to be run on the cluster. And that is all code that is compiled into Kubernetes. Uh, starting in Kubernetes 1.7, um, there is a new admission control plugin um, that can call out to additional servers uh, in the process of accepting it. So in the example in the, um, in the slide, I'm showing an end user creating a pod. Um, the API server calls that internal chain. Some of those initial ones run like pod security policy or image policy. And then um, the generic external admission plugin will take a set of registered uh, extension webhooks that could be running on the server could be running as a function as a, function as a service uh, endpoint, could be running as a microservice, really just a, a simple call out that takes the information about the pod that's being created and sends it to each of the uh, external hooks. Each of those external hooks gets an opportunity to accept or reject the request. And so in the example here, um, you know, these three example webhooks I might choose, webhook one is um, recording that user A requested creating this pod in an external system, such as an audit chain. Um, webhook two is verifying that there's no secrets in the environment variable. So it's looking for something that says underscore password, and it's just gonna say, you know, by policy in my company, we don't allow people to set secrets in environment variables. Webhook two actually rejects the request, and webhook three, which is called at the same time because we call these in parallel, might do a check against LDAP to say, um, you know, does the user creating this pod have access to um, run this service account on this particular system or to use this image. So a more uh, sophisticated policy engine than what is possible in Kubernetes. Because one of the three webhooks failed, the entire request has failed. And so the admission chain would stop and the user would get an error. Now this is a somewhat contrived example, um, but if you followed along with the development of this feature in Kubernetes, um, in Kubernetes today, we have about uh, 10 or 15 built-in admission controllers that can be optionally enabled. Those cover things like pod security policy. They cover uh, node placement policy, um, allowing you to set annotations on a namespace that control what node selectors are allowed on pods. Uh, OpenShift adds about 40 more uh, admission controllers. Kind of our goal here is on a regular Kubernetes cluster, um, it should be possible to add in new admission control as easily as um, adding new APIs. And this feature is alpha. Um, it's it's still in its uh, initial phases in Cube 1.7, but over time we expect to build a set of standard uh, webhook uh, code and examples that make it easy, for instance, for individual operations teams who want to impose specific policies 
to build their plugin hooks in a fairly simple manner. Um, there's some performance costs that comes along with making these callouts, but in general, we found that um, for most use cases, this flexibility is one of the most important extension points for Kubernetes because it's not just about running applications, it's about knowing what is running and um, being able to control some of the aspects of that. In, um, and as a kind of the fourth part of this extension, you know, we talked about adding new APIs, we talked about adding new policy. Um, a fourth uh, part of extensibility coming in uh, Cube 1.7 in an alpha form is the ability to add new CLI extensions. So the Cube control command um, now supports a very simple plugin extension mechanism. Uh, a plugin can be registered via a file in the user's home directory or in a standard location on um, Linux systems. That plugin identifies a name and a description as well as a command to run. And uh, when a user in Cube Control um, invokes, uh, for instance, in the example, the my plugin command, it delegates down and calls um, echo hello plugins, which outputs that back to the, um, the UI. Uh, we envision this uh, being a way for new capabilities, uh, specifically around workflows, uh, to be added to Cube Control. So if there is a specific new API resource that gets added through API extension that needs um, some form of uh, command line tool to make useful. For instance, a policy object that is fairly complex for an end user to create. Uh, a plugin extension to Cube Control might be created that uh, offers a, help, a helpful flow for setting up that policy object the first time. And um, there's a lot of other work going on. You know, I'm just scratching the surface of the extensibility to both CLI and uh, the Cube API. Um, there's a lot of other work going on in the covers to make uh, extensions even more powerful to deliver, to make Cube Control a great way to manage um, not just the resources that ship out of the box with Kubernetes, but uh, extensions that people bring to the platform. And you'll see more of those in uh, the Cube 1.8 and 1.9 releases. So moving on from um, extensibility, uh, security was another big arc uh, in the 1.7 release. Um, you know, Red Hat takes security very seriously, and we've been, uh, you know, not just working to ensure that people can run, um, you know, fully multi-tenant systems um, through the work that we've done with RBAC authentication and uh, the pod security policies to control who can use um, what host-level resources. Um, one of the common requests um, that we've gotten is to make it easier to uh, keep secret data in the platform encrypted. Um, the uh, Cube 1.7 and uh, OpenShift 3.6 will both include this feature in, um, in its uh, core form, the ability to encrypt at rest in the etcd database um, secrets, as well as other resources that the user may want to encrypt. For instance, if you have an extension resource that also contains secret data, uh, you may wish to uh, provide this configuration for that as well. When a user submits a secret to the Kubernetes um, API, We'll take that, uh, we'll look at the encryption config, and then encrypt that using um, either AES CBC or the secret box um, uh, standards for encryption. Um, there's, a, there's some documentation on the trade-offs. You know, our goal was, um, even though in general, um, we still think that whole disk encryption is the best possible way to ensure that your backups don't go walkabout, uh, we did want to offer an out-of-the-box way for administrators to um, to at least uh, in the short term, um, isolate and encrypt secrets uh, an extra level. Um, these secrets, of course, you know, all of the existing characteristics of uh, a Kubernetes system are still preserved. Secrets are always encrypted over the wire and are never stored on disk. Uh, this just adds an extra layer um, to the secrets from the etcd servers. And there's a number of recommendations that we've made in this release on um, how secrets can be uh, more uh, more adequately controlled. Uh, work coming in future releases is going to include a better integration with external uh, secret providers like vaults and uh, other forms of uh, distributed uh, secret management. And so um, if you are interested in encryption uh, at rest of secrets, I urge you to get involved in Kubernetes SIGAuth and follow along as we, um, as we improve uh, the encryption or improve um, the integration of uh, secrets with, uh, with existing solutions for secret management, as well as the security of the overall platform. 
a um, a second part of the Cube One Seven feature arc uh, was uh, tighter controls on the secrets and um, or tighter control on what nodes can access in uh, Kubernetes systems today. Um, there's a fairly flat security model for nodes. Uh, nodes are expected to be um, controlled to a set of resources, but they have access to um, they have access to the resources in bulk rather than the specific resources that schedule to them. In Kubernetes 1.7, um, nodes are protected by a new authorization uh, layer that will uh, restrict what a node can access, not just to the pods that are scheduled onto it, but for instance, only the secrets or persistent volumes that are actually referenced um, by the pods that are scheduled onto it. Um, this is alpha in 1.7. Uh, we expect to continue to evolve this. Uh, if folks who are running um, extensions or uh, third-party network plugins on Kubernetes may find that um, some of the permissions here might be a little aggressive. Uh, and so depending on how um, your network provider integrates with Kubernetes or how your storage provider integrates with Kubernetes, um, there'll be some additional things that we clean up in the next few releases. And of course, um, Another key part of this uh, that uh, that is coming is being evolved in Kubernetes is if nodes are given a unique set of permissions, we obviously want to have a, a standardized path in Kubernetes for nodes to be given um, their identity. And so uh, this is called bootstrapping in Kubernetes. Um, you may have also heard it as self-join or uh, as uh, dynamic registration. Um, this is defining a standardized flow whereby when a kubelet starts up, um, it instead of having its permission um, embedded on that system, so instead of having to distribute a unique credential to every machine, when the kubelet starts up, uh, it actually asks a um, the cluster that it's going to join uh, to receive its identity. And um, the process, um, this is through a new API um, that has been in beta since Kubernetes 1.5 uh, called the, uh, certificate, uh, the specific certificate API. This is very similar to systems that have existed in um, other config management solutions like Puppet um, or uh, uh, key generation systems. The kubelet creates a certificate signing request on startup and it asks the Kubernetes master uh, for a client certificate that will identify it. Uh, a separate process uh, shown in this diagram as the signer, uh, which could be either automated, uh, which is something that's available in an alpha form in Kubernetes, or manual in the terms of um, this is available through the Kubernetes command line and APIs for administrators to script as needed. Um, the signer would see the certificate signing request and can make a decision to grant access. Um, that might involve uh, gathering information about, for instance, um, which node um, the node may, when it makes a request will identify itself. Um, involve an additional verification step that this is a um, that the IP address that is being that is requesting the certificate corresponds, for instance, to an actual running uh, server in the cloud environment or an out of band process that might involve a, a unique secret uh, delivered um, by the the hardware. Um, when it creates the request. Um, this is still fairly early stage. Our goal in Kubernetes is to provide a simple out-of-the-box path that works well on the cloud providers and to allow people to extend uh, or supplement this path with their own logic. And so there is no, there is no expectation that this is um, a closed system, uh, which is why the signer is split out like it is. If the signer decides to accept uh, the request, it will create and sign a client certificate and give that back to uh, the kubelet. The kubelet will then use that client certificate, which uniquely identifies it as node one, um, to make a request for a serving certificate. Um, this is used to fully encrypt the, the communication between um, the kubelet and the cluster. And then the kubelet will proceed with the rest of its normal bootstrapping process. In combination with the previous feature, this means that when nodes join up, not only are they able to easily um, receive a unique uh, certificate that identifies them, but um, they are restricted to the things that that certificate would, um, to things that their identity allows them to. And so we see this being evolved over the next several releases to provide better subdivision of Kubernetes clusters, um, as well as allowing um, 
additional work to be done to make the kubelet load uh, its uh, configuration dynamically. Um, as well, because this is a fully automated process or can be fully automated from the node side, um, this is being tied into certificate expiration. And so the kubelet, as those certificates get closer to expiration, will re-request new certificates and the human or the automated uh, signing process can then uh, grant those uh, again. And we see this as, um, this is a first step in Kubernetes 1.7 that will um, begin to make clusters more uh, automated and autonomous in terms of how individual machines are set up, but still leave administrators with the control over um, who joins their cluster and what level of automation and verification they need as nodes join. The audit feature is also being improved in Kubernetes 1.7. Uh, this was first delivered into Kubernetes 1.5 after being upstreamed uh, from OpenShift. The, um, the first iteration was a simple file-based mechanism or simple log-based mechanism. We then extended that to log to a separate file. In Kubernetes 1.7, we've added a large number of new, um, of new uh, filtering and logging capabilities that allow it to be, um, uh, allow more API actions to be reported to allow filtering and to allow individual uh, syncs of where that data will go. So uh, we envision over the next few releases to see um, the ability to ship specific audit events to uh, distinct systems as necessary, or to send keep a full record of all actions locally and send the most important uh, events remotely. Um, this will uh, continue to evolve. Uh, this is just really the beginning for this, but we envision um, plugging in well to both existing um, enterprise level audit solutions, as well as integrating into the cloud providers out of the box, um, so that it's possible to, for instance, send your logs directly to Stackdriver or um, CloudWatch uh, if you so desire. So um, there, again, as with extensibility, this is really just scraping the surface of the security uh, improvements in Kubernetes 1.7. Um, our overall arc. Uh, for security in 1.8 and 1.9 is going to be to continue to offer better subdivision and better integration with external secret stores. Um, there's a lot of work going on in Kubernetes SIG off, and uh, I highly recommend um, if this is an area that interests you that you join. Um, we'll be talking about uh, topics over the next uh, few months like container identity and uh, giving pods and services unique uh, certificates that allow them to talk to um, to talk to other systems and to have a chain of uh, attestation all the way back to the node that launches them. So we see some of the work that's going into Kube 1.7 is really foundational for um, the next uh, year of evolution of Kubernetes. Uh, in uh, 1.7 um, for running apps, uh, there's really just at the heart of it, uh, the focus on making stateful applications work well on Kubernetes is, um, is we think one of the most important you know, changes in computing is not just allowing this high level of automation for 12-factor applications or simple web services, but to really get at and uh, take the stateful application and make it a first-class concept on top of Kubernetes to uh, solve the common challenges of stateful applications in a way that uh, makes them easier to run, easier to develop, and easier to operate. Uh, so with 1.7, um, moving into beta is the ability to update stateful sets and to have rolling updates performed when those, uh, automatically when those stateful sets are deployed. So uh, this feature has, um, is very similar to the existing Kubernetes deployment and the OpenShift deployment config. When you perform a configuration change on a stateful set, the stateful set controller will begin replacing members of um, begin replacing members of the stateful set one at a time. Uh, it will follow the default rules for stateful sets, which is a very predictable order. Um, a new capability that's being added is a partition. And we see this as a, as a key uh, part of enabling a more complicated orchestration on top of Kubernetes in the future. The, the partition ability lets uh, the person doing the initial update. So when I update a stateful set to pick a new, uh, the V2 image, I can also set a partition number and that says how far 
the rolling update will go before stopping. And so in the example, you can see I've got seven instances in my stateful set. If I perform the update, the stateful set controller starts from the lowest ordinal, and works its way to the right. So it's going to update the first um, pod, which would be um, you know, stateful set zero. It will then, once that's ready, it will then update the second one. Um, and uh, the key point, uh, looks like I didn't color that second V2 correctly. Uh, the key point is with the partition limiter in place, the stateful set will stop its update at two members. And so when we think about canary deployments or the ability to script more complex uh, deployment checks to ensure that an update really is going to be successful, starting with Kubernetes uh, 1.7 and stateful sets, you'll have the ability to pause that deployment and then continue it as it goes. And so uh, you can update the partition number from one to two to five to seven. Um, if you clear it, the rolling deployment will run to full completion and continue for the rest of the set. Uh, we anticipate um, higher level primitives, uh, plugins and Jenkins, uh, tools that might orchestrate Kubernetes deployments like Ansible or some other uh, capabilities that are out there to, to start leveraging the the partition on stateful sets, as well as we plan on bringing it to deployments uh, to give this uh, fine-grained control over the act of deploying and make, uh, make stateful sets even more um, predictable and reliable in their rollout. Uh, in uh, 1.7, this does only update pods, so the pod definition will be changed, but the volume definition will not be. Um, some of the work that's been discussed uh, in the Kubernetes storage SIG about adding uh, resizable uh, volumes uh, may actually show up at some future point in staple sets, but it is not part of uh, Cube 1.7. A second highly requested feature for staple sets is the ability to uh, perform uh, parallel scaling. Uh, today, if you run if you run a very large staple set, um, the staple set controller in Cube 1.6 would progress one at a time. So if you have a thousand pods, it's going to do each each of those thousand pods individually. In 1.7, we added a new alpha capability to stateful sets that allows you to do parallel scale up. So if you have a stateful set with a thousand Cassandra nodes, um, you can set uh, the parallel uh, pod management policy to, or you can set the pod management policy field, which is new, to parallel, and all 1,000 would be created uh, as quickly as possible. That applies both to scale up and scale down. It does not apply to update. So a rolling update of a stateful set will follow the rules of the rolling update. Um, so you can still get predictable controlled rollouts, but for instance, if a large chunk of your pods are deleted, um, a new set of pods would be created to replace them uh, very quickly. Uh, this feature will, we don't anticipate this feature changing much, um, but it is alpha in 1.7 while we get some feedback from uh, people deploying very large stateful sets. And then finally, for the running apps uh, section, uh, daemon sets also uh, receive the ability to be uh, to have rolling updates. Uh, the because daemon sets tend to be more administrator focused or focused on actions that take place across the entire cluster, the rollout options are different. Uh, unlike a stateful set or a deployment. Daemon sets uh, define a max unavailable percentage and the the daemon set controller will then um, guarantee that no more than a certain percentage of those pods are unavailable at a time. So in the example, you can see um, when a daemon set is updated and the max unavailable is set to a third, um, the daemon set will choose to keep um, all but two pods um, stable at any one time. So in the first, in that second line, you can see it spins up um, two new V2 pods. Those will get updated when those become ready um, and are fully running uh, the second version. It'll pick two more pods. In that fourth row, you can see that one of the pods, one of the V1 pods has died. Um, the daemon set controller will only spin up one new one until that V1 pod is replaced. And then you'll see um, in that last line, both the V1 pod that died as well as the previous V2 pod have completed and the rest will be carried out. And this policy is different from both deployment and stateful sets simply because daemon sets um, tend to apply to a cluster in bulk. If you would like to do controlled rollouts of daemon sets across smaller subsets, um, generally you would just create several daemon sets, one for each subset of nodes and update those at a separate time. 
Um, both daemon sets and stateful sets um, track the previous revision through a new resource called controller history. Um, this is a this is an alpha resource technically, um, even though we depend on um, beta. Even though this is uh, the update process of daemon sets and staple sets is itself beta. And so what you can expect is uh, as a user, when another person performs an update on a stateful set or a daemon set, you'll be able to go and view the history, just like you can view the history of a deployment uh, or a deployment config through replica sets and replication controllers. Uh, on the runtime side, uh, we have uh, haven't talked a ton about this, um, but the the container runtime interface in Kubernetes is um, getting close to moving into a beta state. Uh, the container runtime interface, for those who aren't aware, is the abstraction in Kubernetes that separates the container runtime from the kubelet and allows, you know, has a standard set of APIs that it invokes to ensure that containers are running for pods, um, that logs and um, the exec behavior can be supported, that statistics flow and that images are managed. Um, over the last uh, year or so, Red Hat has been working kind of on a standard uh, container runtime that uses OCI and systemd. Um, as we get closer to having CRI move into the beta state in Kubernetes, uh, Red Hat has been pushing um, forward on ensuring that the cryo, um, cryo also reaches an alpha milestone. Uh, it really is focused on supporting um, exactly the subset of features that are necessary for Kubernetes. Um, it doesn't. It adds uh, significantly less overhead um, on a Kubernetes system, and we envision this uh, in the future being um, both a proving point for CRI as well as offering some operational and production advantages uh, when running um, containers on Kubernetes. And so you'll see more of this in the future um, as uh, the CRI and the underlying uh, kubelet becomes uh, more amenable to plugins. Uh, there's also a lot of exciting things um, that may come in over the next uh, year or so around both running um, non-container runtimes like uh, VM-based systems underneath Kubernetes uh, for better isolation of containers. And so we view the evolution of CRI and um, the work that's being done in, uh, in Cryo as a necessary part of the evolution of how we build uh, more secure uh, containerized platforms. Uh, network policy is uh, one of the more popular uh, features in Kubernetes, at least um, so I've heard. In uh, Cube 1.7, uh, it will now move to GA, and the network uh, policy plugins, uh, both in Kubernetes and OpenShift, uh, a large number of them are moving to support network policy uh, as a uh, as a fundamental resource. This allows uh, fine-grained control over which uh, containers and applications uh, can talk to each other across namespaces. Uh, on the OpenShift side, um, we view this as a really huge development because it allows um, end users to specify, um, to collaborate and specify what uh, what other tenants of the system they may wish to receive traffic from, and it allows a finer grain control over what um, over the uh, the network resources that they expose. So. Um, for people who are running not just web applications, but may also be running databases or other as a service type of capabilities uh, on the platform. These, um, this fine grained control uh, allows uh, people to make services available, but then to segregate who can talk to which parts of that application for administrators or for um, other applications on the platform or even for other applications off the platform. And so over, um, over the next, oops, Looks like the example here is wrong. Um, over the next uh, few releases, we expect most of the network uh, plugin providers to uh, enable network policy out of the box and um, to fit some of the other um, concepts around network policy and multi-tenancy more deeply into Kubernetes. And so there is a huge set of other things that, um, I would run out of time trying to to dive into. I did want to uh, call out uh, four four very uh, important areas um, that we won't go into an extreme amount of detail on. Uh, local storage volumes uh, was a proposal for Kubernetes 1.7, and a very early alpha version of it is in Kube 1.7. Um, this is a really exciting feature. Um, it's very commonly requested uh, the ability for 
a pod to request local storage. And then if the pod gets rescheduled, um, to have it be rescheduled back on that machine if that storage is still available. Um, this allows um, applications that don't quite fit into um, the network attached storage model who need much higher IO or only need storage for a short amount of time um, to get to both request that and for administrators to be able to quota control that. We expect in Kubernetes 1.8 um, to see more of these pieces land. Um, and this will be a, a big enabler both for local development and for um, high performance applications. There were a ton of uh, CLI improvements in Kubernetes 1.7, the, the overall usability of the, the command um, extensions that make it easier to manage deployments to get better information uh, from the server as a number of performance improvements. Uh, the cube proxy, uh, which is kind of the, the current heart of how applications talk to each other on Kubernetes today, got a, a massive set of performance uh, improvements that we expect uh, will continue into the Kubernetes 1.8 release. And then service catalog, which um, many of the folks on this call are probably familiar with. Um, the service catalog work uh, continues apace. Um, we expect over the Kubernetes 1.8 and 1.9 timeframes to um, to really bring that to um, you know a first class uh, behavior in Kubernetes. Service Catalog is actually one of the first consumers of the extension points um, I mentioned before, and so we expect um, a fairly rich experience, um, and that to be the proving grounds for um, on Kubernetes being able to add new capabilities in a seamless way uh, without having to necessarily compile those into the Kubernetes project itself. And with that, um, I'd love to take some questions. Uh, if there are any, oh, there, there are there are a couple, um, Clayton, and I've also posted in the, in the notes in the chat um, through the release notes for the Kubernetes 1.7 release. So, um, and we have a couple of deep dives coming: one on Creo, um, another on Service Catalog in the upcoming um, uh, OpenShift Commons briefing schedule. Um, the first question, or the the most recent question, will go that way. Um, do you have the user context in the webhook? And this is going back to the yes. section we were talking about extensibility. Yeah, a fundamental part of, um, of policy extension is knowing who the acting user is. And so that is a part of both um, the extension mechanism um, as well as for um, or for the, uh, the webhook extensions for po emission policy. Um, but it is also available uh, to uh, extension API servers. Uh, and so um, you will continue to see that propagated through the rest of the system. And there was one early one which um, sort of related to OpenShift and Chuck is asking if we are going to create a client library for OpenShift similar to the client Go of, K, of Kubernetes. Yes, that is a goal. Um, there was a number of really important changes uh, that have continued to occur in Kubernetes 1.5, 1.6, and 1.7 to clean up the internal structure of those libraries uh, to make them really be consumable. Um, so it is definitely a, a short-term or a near-term goal for us to uh, have a very, uh, a very powerful Go client library and as well to um, be able to reuse the extension mechanisms, um, or sorry, the um, the generation mechanisms that we've been working on in Kubernetes uh, for the AP, OpenShift API uh, as well. Uh, a key part really of um, being able to do API extension is to have client extension. And so even though I didn't cover that in, in extreme detail, um, we want all of the languages to have very good Kubernetes clients and for any extension of Kubernetes to also be able to use those clients. So, um... Mateus from GetUp Cloud is asking, how about backporting? Are any of those being re-implemented in on old versions? Um, of the features that I described, um, there's no explicit plan to backport those to older Kubernetes versions. Um, a large chunk of the, you know, speaking for OpenShift, a large chunk of the API aggregation and API extensibility and the service catalog work. Um, is specifically something that Red Hat is driven because you know we believe really strongly in extensibility. Um, some of those capabilities will be in Kubernetes in OpenShift 3.6. Um, uh, the uh, encryption at rest is targeted for 3.6.1 uh, in a in a 
early access form. And there's a couple of other uh, items in this list that um, may make it into the uh, OpenShift 3.6 release. Um, we're, we're, in general, we were focused more on the um, security and extensibility aspects in terms of backports for OpenShift 3.6. Um, let's see, somebody's asking for, and it should make him write it. Uh, it would be great if we can have a readme on Kublet bootstrapping on OpenShift and um, check. Yeah. You could make that is, that is, um, uh, Kublet bootstrapping has been one as it evolved in Kubernetes 1.7. Um, there's been an early version of it in OpenShift and Kubernetes since the 1.5 release. Um, our goal, we really do want to make bootstrapping because it's so fundamental to um, how in the future we'll do uh, certificate regeneration. It allows um, a, an external CA to be used to sign certificates. It allows us to um, delegate trust from that initial kubelet bootstrapping to the containers that run on the platform. And because it just reduces the amount of overhead necessary to stand up new nodes, um, it's likely to be a very strong focus for us on the OpenShift side to have um, that both be a uh, you know, in, initially we will do a better job of documenting what's already there, um, but we intend to use it more fully to um, to make it easier to stand up nodes. So um, while in 1.7 um, and 3.7 OpenShift, you may not see it be fully supported, um, over the long term, bootstrapping will become the de facto way that we stand up new nodes. Cool. There's one more coming. Are there any federation updates coming to 1.7? Um, there was a lot of work on federation in the 17 time frame. Um, the federation is still alpha. There's a number of things that we still think need to be closed out, uh, such as upgrading and uh, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, getting things in final working shape. Um, so uh, there was a ton of work that was done in the 17 time frame um, in terms of functional changes, um, not a, a terribly large number. I don't see any other questions. I'm going to pop over and just remind everybody that um, the OpenShift Commons gathering is coming up um, soon and um, we have limited space again, but um, it will be at KubeCon and you will be able to hear Clayton give by then. It should be the same update on um, hopefully Kube 1.8 and that'll be there. You can register that. And then all of the other I mentioned um, that there were other OpenShift Commons, it's common is that uh, events. The events webpage has all of the other Kube related um, calendar folks here. And I think we have a big week coming, in the, maybe not over the 4th of July week, but um, we're going to have uh, Aparna Sinha from Google is going to give um, a technical roadmap. Um, the road ahead for 1.8 talk on July 11th. There'll be a distributed tracing with Jaeger, um, which is, and then some, a couple of other ones. And then coming up soon, there'll be one um, on service catalog. And we ha I haven't found a date yet for um, another one on cryo, but it should probably be um, sometime in July. So it's a very busy calendar. So please do keep Keep an eye out and we'll um, try and keep you all up to date on everything that's coming out the pike with Kubernetes and OpenShift. Um, there's you know, a lot of interest in this and so we hope that you'll stay tuned and if you haven't joined the OpenShift Commons yet, please do so and we'll get you on the Slack channel and into our mailing list so that you don't miss any of these events. And um, I still don't see any other questions. So Clayton, I think um, you've done an awesome job and we can really just say thank you very much and hopefully we'll see you in Austin and um, you'll feel better and have a great 4th of July weekend, everyone, wherever you are. Thank you, Diane.